Good evening. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this timely discussion on influenza, COVID-19 and RSV as we head into the winter season. My name is Rodney Pierce. I'm a practicing general practitioner in Adelaide and the current chair of the Immunisation Coalition. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Immunisation Coalition acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and future and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people today. To explain the objectives of this webinar, we are here tonight as a multidisciplinary group to discuss flu, COVID-19 and RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. As we talk about each of these infections and diseases, we hope to share information across general practice, pharmacy, mobile workplace vaccination services, and try to achieve the following. To keep each healthcare professional sector abreast of key activities and in initiatives planned this year around influenza, COVID, and vaccinations to share strategies and tactics aligned with government initiatives aimed at increasing vaccination rates that may be useful for other healthcare professional sectors to consider. This is a webinar series. The May and June webinars will be updates on tonight's webinars, and we'll focus through these three webinars on how the season is tracking, activities and initiatives that we believe are both helpful and working to increase vaccination rates and identify learnings that we hope will be useful for next year. So I'm delighted to be joined tonight by four experts in their field. Firstly, Professor Ian Barr, the Deputy Director of the WHO Collaboration Centre for Re Reference and Research on Influenza based at the Doherty Institute in in Melbourne. He's an honorary professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Melbourne. And he is also an Immunisation Coalition member. Welcome, Ian. Next, Chris Campbell, General Manager of Policy and Program Development at the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia, adjunct senior lecturer at University of Queensland School of Pharmacy, research fellow at the Queensland University of Technology. Chris, welcome. Next, Catherine Keel, a nurse practitioner specialising in travel, health and immunisations. And is, she's a member of the International Society of Travel Medicine and a fellow of the Faculty of Travel Medicine, the Australasian College of Tropical Medicine. Welcome. And lastly, uh, Kirsten Belouche, general practitioner with over 20 years experience in mobile vaccination clinics around Australia. Welcome. Firstly, we'd like, uh, finally, we'd also like to acknowledge uh, CSL Sequiris, Sanofi and BioSelect for supporting this educational activity. Now, let's get started. So I guess, Ian, um, we should start by getting an overall picture on the number of cases of influenza, COVID, RSV, and give us a bit of a feel at how Australia's going compared to the last few years and compared to the COVID. So, Ian? Yeah, so thanks, Rod. So, uh, as always, these things change from year to year. Uh, I think, uh, you know, COVID is on the way down and uh, influenza and RSV are on the way up to cut to the chase. But, uh, you know, in terms of cases uh, which are reported into the various systems, such as the NNDSS, which keeps track of the laboratory confirmed influenza, uh, influenza cases, RSV cases and COVID, that gives us a reasonable guide as to what's happening uh, in the in the uh, Australian uh, uh, states uh, on a fairly regular uh, um, basis. So currently for COVID, there's been some 105,000 cases reported to the NNDSS. So it gets the gold medal. The silver medal goes to RSV with some 42,000 cases uh, reported, lab confirmed, and the bronze goes to influenza at this stage with 36,000. Now, in terms of how those numbers compare to previous years, COVID is down and uh, uh, we've had a small wave there going since about November. Um, and that's that's starting to uh, to end. Uh, RSV is on the way up, especially in New South Wales. 
and influenza is slowly increasing. Uh, but we did have quite a uh, quite a bout of influenza through October, November, and December of last year. So the numbers for influenza are certainly up on previous years. RSV are heading towards a similar way, and COVID is on the way down from previous years and previous waves or outbreaks of COVID. So, Ian, is there any sort of statewide trends? You mentioned some of the state variants. So is that uh, kind yeah. of standing out at the moment? Yeah, so the East Coast, as usual, is leading the pack in terms of uh, outbreaks reported to the NNDSS and and through FluCan, the hospitalisation uh, network that looks uh, at what's happening in the hospitals in terms of COVID, RSV and influenza. Uh, so the East Coast is out in front uh, on that area. Uh, certainly, um, that's not unexpected. That's usually what happens. And then over time, things uh, drift to the west, South Australia, Northern Territory, and uh, and WA mainly. So uh, nothing out of the ordinary in terms of state-to-state -state patterns at this stage, uh, although the RSV is probably showing the highest increase in New South Wales and Queensland at the moment. So that's not too unusual. And we used to have, uh, I think, um, New Zealand used to be the trendsetter if they had an <laughs> outbreak and um, suddenly... Uh, we would hear a headline in the news saying there's a major epidemic because they've had one case in New Zealand, so then it comes east, I think. So two yeah. questions. Is it a major epidemic or is that just the, what the media likes to say and uh, um, is it going to move uh, uh, from the east to the west in big numbers? Yeah, so in, in the past, you're right, New Zealand has seeded quite a few of the outbreaks in Australia, but in recent years, we've returned the favour to them and most of the cases... Uh, been going the other way so <clears throat> i don't know what's quite going on there but certainly a, a little bit of difference there but in australia the east to west movement still is pretty apparent uh, at least for some of these winter ills like uh, like influenza and rsc i work in country practices and we're noticing uh the numbers are going up uh also in our practice but also we're noticing some vaccine uh rates going up but catherine from a nurse practitioner's perspective are you seeing any sort of uh, discussion or people sort of um, starting to talk about the amount of flu or respiratory infections around? Definitely. I think it really depends on the age group of our patients. Definitely the elder, the over 65s are always intrigued. Um, we're seeing kind of in SA, we, we're kind of seeing an early flu, as you'd probably be aware. Um, but there, there's a lot of discussion about the RSV vaccinations and especially, obviously, in the over 60s and over 65s. So, Chris, or maybe Kirsten, maybe Chris, to start with, are you seeing um, a sort of an uptick or activities high uh, from your point of view, seeing the infections or people coming through? Uh, definitely the awareness, Rod, around um, uh people who have known um, others who have had influenza we're finding that useful uh, to help to drive up immunization rates you know there the, there is a, a, as Ian pointed to a higher notification that this started at, at the start of the year uh, but the RSV um uh, the, the there's been a lot of discussion around the, uh, RSV uh, particularly from an awareness perspective what we are seeing though uh, is uh, and perhaps as the low rates of COVID, we are seeing uh, less inquiries around COVID um, uh, immunisation. And I know part of the future discussion will be around that, you know, and how we can um, uh, support the immunisation rates for all three. But uh, look, influ influenza uh, discussions are on the rise as well as RSV. They're the, uh, the, main, the most common uh, conversation they're bringing in. Kirsten? Uh, in the workplace setting, um... The strongest inf uh, interest is in influenza vaccinations, which is usual. And the uh, the numbers we're seeing are comparable to this time last year. So in terms of number of workplaces organising an on-site visit and then the uptakes of the, the participants, which sits at about just over 30%, 33%, 35% uptake, and that's much the same. So it's um, tracking much like last year. Um, yeah, it seems, sorry, Chris. Yeah. No, there, there was one additional thing around uh, awareness that we, we're seeing more requests for rapid antigen tests that have all three in it, Rod. So you, with 
COVID, RSV and influenza, the, the understanding that it could be either of the three. So those rapid antigen tests that have the threes helping to uh, build awareness of the three conditions. So with awareness, then it comes uh, about vaccination. So um, Kirsten, you, you raised a point about the vaccination rates. And I guess the frustration uh, a little bit in Australia is we got some of the world's best vaccines, they're good vaccines, but the last few years we've actually seen a drop down in the numbers of people, that particularly the under fives and the older adults who aren't getting vaccinated. So I guess um, reflecting on, first of all, is there something about our vaccines? Um, there seems to be plenty around. Um, the under fives is a, a program that's relatively free. We've got um, other centres that are vaccinated. But um, even though there's an awareness of it, but the rates are down. So any, um, any comments maybe going around the room? Um, Ian, are you hearing any reasons why people don't or is there something about the vaccines or any well, thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I think uh, COVID is a hard sell. Uh, you know, the number of uh, people being vaccinated, even the elderly who are most at risk. You know, I looked up some of the numbers, some of the government numbers uh, as of yesterday, and something in the 75-year-old age group, uh, only 38% of people have been uh, vaccinated with a COVID vaccine in the last six months. The 65 to 74 is only 23%. And the 18 to 64 year old is a is a measly 3.5 percent. So I think, you know, I think people are well and truly over COVID, even the people at most risk. So I think that's that's definitely a concern. And, and uh, you know, less than half of the aged care residents have had a vaccine in the last six months. So, you know, I think they're all very vulnerable groups. And I don't know how you get the message out there, but it's certainly not getting through. So yeah, we we. Um got a letter from the, the department, the Commonwealth Department, saying it's good that we're talking about all three viruses. And I've just got a question that's been sent to me. So a reminder to everyone, this is being recorded, so you better access this later. Questions can be sent to the uh, chat line, I think it is where it's going. So do that, it's being recorded. But um, maybe Catherine, your thoughts about uh, the vaccination rates, um, is the RSV helping because people are aware of it and testing it or is it confusing it, people thinking they have to get RSV vaccine, forget the flu? Any thoughts or what do you reckon is going on? Yeah, I think there's a lot of confusion out there. I think we've got vaccine fatigue, post, obviously, as discussed, post-COVID. Um, um, people are kind of, kind of, you know, they're aware of the influenza, um, but I do think we need to educate, especially the parents of the under fives. I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of under fives coming through and we need to be accessible. We need to um, think out the box a little bit with our appointments. You know, people are busy and so forth. We need to do our after hours clinics. We need to do Saturday clinics. We need to use all our health professionals. Um, and I think we need some more information about RSV. The people really don't understand it. They don't understand um, the vaccines, um, if they're eligible and so forth. So education and accessibility is my key areas. So Chris, you've, uh, as a group and a sector, made yourself more available. Do you think that's going to be a strategy that works because uh, you're out there, but the numbers are down? This is the message now. What about the end of the season? You're going to go back and say, well done, or we're going to still be... Uh, um, uh, hmm. No, it's, it's a great question. Like from a, In terms of uh, rates, this is the highest number by March that pharmacists have ever administered, ever. And so whilst uh, overall, um, and this is why I'm so appreciative, we're here as immunisation team of everyone stepping up and trying to make sure we're improving the rates and, and the multidisciplinary approach. Uh, but we, and that, that's for a few reasons. One, we have uh, a broader range of ages uh, that pharmacists can administer influenza vaccine, for example, um, in pretty much every jurisdiction from five, except for Queensland, from six months. Uh, and the free flu program in Queensland and soon to start in WA has started to make a, a, a big uh, impact from the pharmacy sector. Um, we have two, it began two weeks before Easter and it was probably right. You know, we, we have started to have the increase there. Now we're still early in the season, we still have a long way to go. Um, what we are finding, and um, I can I notice some of the questions coming in the chat around co-administration, uh, around 8 to 10 percent of our volume uh, is, a, is administered with another vaccine. So they may be coming in through influenza, but then the discussion happening with COVID. Um, and so, uh, yeah, er, er, early season, Rob, but um, uh, it's, it's positive signs in terms of um, the pharmacy space. And that is because 
the national immunization program now is available in uh, in community pharmacy so that removing out of pocket costs so um Kirsten, i flick to you about whether you think cost is a barrier we've got free vaccines in children and some of the lowest numbers we've got free vaccines in elderly you're in workplaces they were sort of out of circulation for vaccines for a while now they're back in so is the cost a barrier and then maybe any thoughts of whether the the uh, rsv vaccine cost barrier because that's pricey so kirsten <clears throat> Well, it's always free at work, isn't it? Because the employer's paying. So it's it's quite an interesting test market. And then, um, of course, the workers are probably generally, you know, we don't have so many over 65s. We've got a more healthy adult range. Um, the uptakes are just so stubborn, so stubbornly set at 30 something percent and that's in the US and here and it's global in terms of workplace and no one's been able to work out how to shift that. Um, so it's not so much that it's free. I think those uptakes are pretty good for a healthy working population and I, I just attribute that, yes, because it's free, but also just that in this case the vaccine's coming to where the person is, not the person having to go to where the vaccine is. So it's flipped in that sense. I think that helps. I, I don't think that helps with what we're going to do with the rest of the population because we can't literally go around a door knock, can we? But um, the vaccine fatigue and influenza isn't quite translating into the workplace flu at least. It's still early in the season, as Chris said, so uh, we'll report back more later. Um, so, so this, uh, Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um Ian, did you um, comment on whether you can give vaccines together? Because my understanding that we can give all the vaccines together, Chris has said they give most of theirs together and we've got some questions about giving them together. My understanding uh, is there's no, no reason we can't give them together. It's just a question of um, the data on it is still coming through. Yeah, I think the only one you might want to uh, consider is the adjuvanted vaccine. So, you know, I'm not sure about giving the two adjuvanted vaccines for the elderly if you're giving an RSV vaccine and a uh, uh, an influenza uh, adjuvant vaccine. Uh, I think uh, maybe that might need some uh, consideration, but uh, I'm not a medico, so that's probably better coming from you, Rod. Yeah, I think that um, the uh, data is is thin, so I think that's why there's a suggestion. I think Atagi um, says uh, be aware of the lack of data, but Chris, you mentioned uh, a comment, but um, it's better to get a vaccine in an arm than it is to leave it out because the data about the reduction is is small. So, Chris? Oh, look, I was just going to reference a um, really great resource from MC is around co-administration. I might put it in the chat, um, Rod, it's really useful uh, to help to guide that. Yes, there's, um, as you know, there's a slight increase in uh, maybe localised reaction, but better in the arm than not, and having that discussion uh, with the person who is there getting the vaccination around uh, that and they might have free time to come back in the two to four weeks um uh, but but a lot are, are, are really comfortable to get it then and there um, with the uh, the two adjuvanted Catherine do you yeah. want to throw out some hints as to the uh, best way to get people to vaccinate it what, what are your tricks um so I my policy is we, it's a team effort you know pharmacies councils primary health nurse led um, mobile clinics. I would say with the Australian Immunisation Handbook states that we can give these vaccines all together, but just be aware with the adjuvant, as as already discussed, we may have a more of a reaction. However, when they're in the door, it's an informed consent, informed decision. Um, I would administer them all together if they're not likely to come back, um, but it's a discussion. So looking at all those NIP vaccines that um, are offered and just speaking about the RSV the issue with the RSV vaccine is the cost um, but just obviously being informed if they do have private health with extras they they, they could have a rebate back on it. So um, I'll swing it around the, the table again it's the cost is an issue but um, there's also the confidence in the people giving the advice so um, I just uh, wonder any Comment, um, Ian, do you see of any barriers coming or when you notice the numbers or do you know anything generally? Then I'll go to each of the uh, others uh, to maybe look at uh, the importance of 
being the person who advised them and coming from the health professional. Ian, any general comments? Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, cost is a small component uh, for the uh, people outside the NIP program. So we saw back in 2022 that we did have an uptick uh, in, in vaccine uptake, even though it was a bit of a shambolic rollout. So I think cost uh, will have an impact, but it's not the panacea. It's not going to change a 35% into a 65% uh, vaccine uh, uptake. So, you know, I think uh, I think uh, people need to understand the impact of influenza better, and especially in the vulnerable groups. Uh, so we've already talked about the younger groups, the six months to under fives, uh, only 28% of uh, that age group were vaccinated last year. So that's a very low uptake uh, for a vaccine, which is now on the recommended list for that age group. Uh, for, so I think uh, uh, we could do better across all age groups. Even the elderly uh, vaccination rates have been dropping a bit in the last few years. So they used to be very, very solid, uh, but even they're uh, they're uh, reducing. So I think the whole vaccine fatigue thing is is for real across all age groups. Catherine, um, I think it depends in your local area. Um, I think since COVID vaccine, it's really important to have a relationship with your patient so they are aware who you are. I get, you know, after giving so many COVID vaccines, they come and ask my opinion. Um, so having someone that's accessible and they can ask questions, no pressure, and um, they can give reliable resources. I think it's really important um, for, for our patients. Uh, Kirsten and then Chris. Sorry, I was reading some of the interesting discussion in the chat. Um, so I might just pass over to Chris unless there's something specific you think I can add in from my vantage point. So Chris, a couple of the questions coming up uh, are pharmacists offering vaccine clinics. Um, and uh, um, I guess uh, that brings the question of differences between states and the regulations. But um, <laughs> and and just while we're on that subject, um, someone has talked about councils and mm. um, all providers should be stepping up and all should yep. be supported. And certainly, the Immunisation Coalition is keen to uh, remind everyone that councils have an important role and it's the whole team and everyone stepping up. But um, getting back to it, seems to be healthcare providers have to mention it. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. the, the note that if you don't mention it, that people don't know that they've got a choice potentially. So mm -hmm. the cost um, is up to them. But Chris, just generally about um, availability and clinics and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, look, it, it's really a hybrid model uh, that happens um, across majority pharmacies. Uh, a lot will have clinic days, uh, particularly for children, Rod. Uh, we'll, we'll set aside uh, specific days and I notice even more clinic rooms uh, being painted with um Images that make it more ch children friendly um, uh, and uh, batching those uh, appointments, uh, but then also being available for opportunistic. Um, and what we have a policy is no wrong door. And that's 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 also no wrong door in terms of provider, but also no wrong door uh, in terms of what immunisation they're there to get. And then you're having discussion about others. Um, and so it might be COVID um, discussion around boosters that drives them in, but you have influenza available. You did discuss price and there has been um, uh, a, you know, it's, it's removing just one of those barriers. It's not the only one. Um, it's, you know, there's a, an awareness piece, but um, if you can uh, decrease uh, out-of-pocket costs for some some uh, people, particularly over 65, it's a really big, it's a, um, it's a, it's a really big incentive. Um, you add then into convenience and ease of access and uh, having it available when uh, someone is ready uh, to get that, that can be really helpful. There are two, as you mentioned the state variations. There are two states where pharmacists can administer RSV vaccines. And uh, it is then around, that's New South Wales and Victoria at the moment. We suspect like all other things, all the rest of the country will come on board. Uh, but it is uh, it is about offering the choice, not making the decision on the behalf of the um, of the person. It's, it's, it's their decision in terms of uh, what protection they want to provide themselves or their family and um, just making sure that uh, that informed choice is made and, and you having that conversation for whatever reason uh, that they're coming into your practice. So Kirsten, I would like to um, just throw to you the question of different states offer different incentives. Does that make much difference in your sort of setting with the workplace? Because some um, states are offering free vaccines, some, um, and we'll, 
get to the RSV specifically in a second, um, what's being offered by the state will surely affect what um, your work does? Or do you think these days businesses are just saying, look, let's just do it and not rely on the state? Any comments about that? Yeah, I, I don't think it affects it as much as we might hope or imagine. I um, think businesses are doing it. Businesses over a certain size, just it feels like they're all doing it. Um, they're doing it anyway. And they might just say, um, um, do we get it free if we're getting it at work? In Queensland, um, uh, providers like ours that take it to the workplace, we use vaccines we acquire on the private market and we, re we are reimbursed for the vaccine and reimburse for it in Queensland. In WA, there's no mechanism for workplace providers to be reimbursed in the same way you are in Queen, we are in Queensland. So over there, it causes us, you know, our organisation mm. to lose. Usually government departments are the ones who get a little tighter on the budget and say it's free in our state. So if you can't do it free at work, we'll sort out something else. Um, but private businesses just go ahead with this anyway. For a lot of businesses, it's not an enormous expenditure. It's seen as a fairly inexpensive uh, service to offer to their employees that businesses feel actually works and is wanted. So it's partly an employee-pleasing benefit in large organisations and in small ones their motivator is more around reducing sick leave. So, um, again, it just doesn't seem to shift that much. So um, if I want to flick back to the RSV, so Ian mentioned that the cases are up, maybe because we're just testing it, but on the basis that it's here, um, the TGA has approved uh, RS vaccines. There's monoclonal antibodies that are being used uh, for uh, babies and infants, but again, the state variation. Two RSV prefusion vaccines for 60-year-olds, um, there's the uh, Orexvia and the Abrisvo. Uh, that's uh, potentially available for pregnant women, adults, 60. Uh, but the rollout looks at its infancy. We've got the state variation, um, the monoclonal antibodies in West Australia, Queensland, New South Wales. So with all this stuff become available, where does that fit? Maybe, Catherine, you, you can um, comment. Um, does that kind of change it? Do people just feel confused? You alluded to that before. So what's... Um, what, yeah. what's this going to do and and what are people and is that really the problem or is it just us not asking people to get vaccinated i think it's a mixture of both like i'm a palm and i'm confused that all the states do different things it'd be fantastic if we all rolled out so obviously it's on the news um mothers and fathers and and patients are asking different questions can we get that here can we not and so forth um so i think if we have some uniform Common Commonwealth um, discussions, so it will make it easier for us if we're all on the same page. I'm sure the pharmacists feel like, feel like that. If we all know what they can give, what they can't give, it will make life a lot easier. Yeah, Chris, um, interstate variability is that helping, or is it still us forgetting to mention it? Oh, look, it's heading the right direction. You know, I, I'm. I'm a use their glass up full sort of person. So I think that I think that there is the intention there. Uh, we do have a, a ways to go. Um, you know, we we um, are really supportive of that team approach. And you know, where, where someone uh, they should be a wherever their vaccines are available, they should be able to get the vaccine that's right for them. And so, still on, still on the road. Uh, hopefully, next year when we do this rod, we'll be able to say we have full uh, agreement between the states and territories on how it's um, implemented and rolled out and what. Uh, what each provider can give. So, Ian, um, you, you've been around a long time. A long time's a good time. But uh, from your point of view, and looking at the national figures and seeing what the states do, uh, should we be having a an announcement and the Commonwealth saying flu is here so that we can announce the season and all put our shoulders to the wheel at the same time? And what do you think about the state variation and the way it rolls out? Yeah, thanks for that uh, ages comment, uh, Rod. Um, look, I think, uh, you know, it has not been well supported, uh, apart from COVID, uh, by the government in the last few years. So, influenza has sort of fallen off the off the uh, list of uh, things the government seems to be interested in. So, I think hopefully this year that will be uh, attended to, at least in some degree. I think uh, you know it, the heavy lifting has been left to the states. 
Uh, but again, that's been offered on uh, 2022. Uh, most states, apart from uh, apart from Northern Territory and ACT, had some form of uh, free program across the board for influenza. Uh, 2023, that sort of fell apart a bit, and only I think it was only Western Australia had free vaccine. And now this year we've got uh, Western Australia and Queensland offering free vaccine for influenza, and uh, the same two states offering uh, monoclonal antibody for newborn uh, babies for RSV, uh, and New South Wales offering a very cut down program only for high risk uh, babies for the RSV monoclonal antibody. So it is a little bit confusing, uh, I think, uh, and uh, you know clearly if the Commonwealth had a, a more um, uh, uh, inclusive approach that they would uh, consider both influenza and the RSV monoclonal antibody or the RSV vaccine for, for uh, pregnant uh, women uh, to be important measures that should be covered by a national program and not by bits and pieces through states. So thanks, uh, Kirsten. Um, at a workplace, do you uh, see your role to uh, maybe advertise other vaccines other than flu? Because uh, the Immunisation Coalition decided uh, yesterday to announce that it was the beginning of the flu season because no one else seemed to be doing it. So uh, we took it upon ourselves. But um, what's uh, what's the job of uh, you know providers who are out there doing, doing the vaccine? Should we all say, oh, by the way, there's 20 other vaccines you should have, so check with your provider? Or is it just a matter of getting on and making sure you vaccinate the group you've got the job for? I think we can we definitely do better in that regard, Rod. Um, so we will send out to we're vaccinating. So there's a couple of hundred thousand people, but the workplace market's about a million Australians get a flu vaccine at work every year, and all of those, um, and that's thirty percent of the say the three or four million who receive an email to say, hey, this is being offered in your workplace all those potential patients will receive information from their workplace provider. You know, with FAQs, there's no reason we couldn't add a little education piece into that. So I can definitely look at doing that. And in terms of other vaccines, most workplace providers like mine are very open to offering others where there's enough uptake. At the moment, you can't acquire the COVID vaccine on the private market in the way that you need to to run a meaningful workplace program. You can access government vaccines, but the logistics aren't quite um, responsive enough for um, workplace the workplace setting. It's all a little bit sluggish. Um, um, but I think once there's a private market for COVID, that will be an important um, service channel for people accessing that. And... Um, RSV when that becomes relevant for the 18 to 65 year olds. So it's important to be open to the idea of talking about it, but not necessarily be the delivery. Catherine, any comments? We've got about um, uh, um, another 10 or so minutes where we can um, talk. Um, so any comments about uh, talking about the other vaccines that maybe people aren't coming in for and where that fits in your strategy? Yeah, it totally fits in my strategy. So whenever I do mobile clinics, um, clinics, um, face-to-face -face clinics uh, as well in, in, the, in my clinic, and I take every opportunity to go through NIP um, vaccines, making sure they're all up to date, discuss things, discuss the RSV vaccine. So I think we take every opportunity to inform um, our patients when we can. And at-risk people just aren't... Um... The one you're vaccinating, there's at risk of other uh, illnesses, there's at risk that need uh, other vaccines and there's different categories. So it gets pretty complicated. Chris, what are some of the strategies you're using both to advertise as in market all of the vaccines available, but also um, to maybe some of the tricks to remind people it's worth getting these vaccines? Yeah, look, and it's it's quite common uh, where we'll be recommending vaccines that are either not available in the pharmacy or not able to be given um, uh, at a subsidised rate. So uh, now, whilst that's decreasing, the, there's still that um, uh, requirement. Uh, most of those referrals are coming from uh, the fact that we can now check air rod, and we do that before someone comes uh, for any vaccine, and we're using that as um, an opportunity to sense check that against the immunisation handbook. Here's what uh, you uh, recommended. Here's what you can get covered um, under uh, any funded program, whether it's the state or NIP. Uh, but having a systemised approach into that and and uh, 
uh, focusing on each um, person who's in for an immunisation because we know that uh, there is a lot of opportunity for us to um, help to close the gap on uh, a lot of vaccine preventable disease. So I'll go around um, to everyone again, but maybe have a think about what are the two biggest challenges in the particular sector that you're working in? And um, a few questions have come. Should we be advertising more to public or to providers? I guess my uh, instinct is to say both, but um, what are the two biggest challenges uh, that people see or problems in their particular area? I'll go Kirsten, then Ian, then Catherine, then Chris, but... Kirsten, what are the two biggest challenges you think um, in your sector now and in the workplace? I think the vaccine fatigue or someone called it in the chat vaccine burnout is very real. Um, and I think it's going to take a while for that to um, move through. And um, just that in the old days, government used to put a lot more effort behind raising awareness that it's in flu, it's flu season and it used to be more in the news and there was just a lot more of that higher level, like widespread public awareness. So in the absence of that, um, I think it's a lot of it's fallen on providers now to be as proactive as we can um, to our target patients. So I think it, awareness and information is the biggest challenge that we're all facing. Yeah, remembering that still one of the biggest influences is a healthcare professional and a provider saying these are the vaccines and we recommend it. So, Ian, what do you think are the barriers? Should we be advertising more to public or to... Yeah, look, yeah. I think there's a general uh, lack of awareness of who's at risk. Uh, people think they're bulletproof, uh, even their kids are bulletproof, and that a lot of these diseases are not important. You know, if you ask uh, people, did anybody die from influenza under 18 last year, people would probably say nobody. In fact, there was 13, and that's probably an underestimate uh, in that age group. So I think awareness of who's at risk and trying to get that message across. And I think for, for new uh, vaccines and uh, new treatments, such as what's become available for RSV, is a lack of understanding of what the heck RSV is and, and uh, what age groups are at risk there as well. Yeah, I got contacted today from the media saying that the new test for 18 panel testing um, and certainly the message uh, we talk about is test early and once you know what you're dealing with then you can make a decision about the management. If it's RSV, you need to talk about the spread and the potential protection. If it's COVID or flu, you can treat it. So we need to remember. Um, yeah, I, think, I think in some ways the multiplex testing, the patients see the result and that's very informative. So... If any GPs are out there thinking about the value of multiplexing, you know, I would highly recommend that as a way of instructing patients about what the heck they've got, and then they might go home and Google it and find out a bit more information. Yeah, Catherine, from your end, what are the, you reckon, a couple of challenges? Yeah, same, same as Kirsten and Ian, education, education of patients, parents, you know, influenza is a serious disease, um, and accessibility. We're all doing our own thing, trying to get those vaccines in arms. But just like I said right at the beginning, just making sure, you know, appointment times are after hours, Saturdays, you know, mobile clinics, just getting uh, getting to the patient and being accessible. Yeah, and Chris, uh, from your area, what do you reckon are some of the, the biggest challenges? Not going to surprise you that awareness is going to be the top of the list. <laughs> you know, if we can start to prepare for uh, 2025 right, right now. And so we have a launch in end of March, early April. And and, uh, and that's particularly particularly around influenza. But now, if we did that with influenza, the COVID be very clear around COVID um, booster, um, have that early information coming through, and then the role of RSV. If we do that early and plan early, that helps with stock. That helps with calendar bookings. That helps with um, perception and awareness. So uh, that large launch, uh, you know, bring bring back the the official launch of the influenza season. But congratulations, Rod, from uh, launching mm -hmm. it unofficially yesterday. Um, and then some targeted programs. I think there's some at risk populations. I know we list them, um, uh, and then you know perhaps there's perhaps there's ways that we can uh, better reach the targeted programs. But um, I think awareness is probably still top on all of our lists. So, Ian, um, someone's alluded to uh, which strains are circulating. Uh, I guess that potentially goes on to um, uh, 
is there, you know, the vaccines up to it and all that sort of stuff. So is it useful knowing what, what strains are circulating or is it too early in the season to kind of get it? A... Look, I think it, it is very early in the season, so things change, but it's usually first in best dress for influenza viruses. So H3 viruses are currently uh, the, uh, the majority of the viruses we're seeing. Uh, there are still H1 viruses, which was the, the virus which circulated mostly in Australia last year. Uh, H3N2 usually has uh, some bad connotations about it. So the elderly uh, are more susceptible to H3s and we usually have higher hospitalizations and uh, death rates in the elderly with H3N2. So I think just watch this space, but uh, if that continues, that could be a bad omen for the for the season if it if and when it kicks off. Yeah, the numbers of people with the infection are thousands, like a 40 plus, 36 plus. So the numbers are impressive, but is that because we've seen numbers of COVID and deaths of COVID and hospitalisation? Is that fatiguing everyone you think, Ian? Look, I think numbers are pretty much irrelevant for people. Uh, you know, it's what they hear on the radio or see on the television or hear from person to person. Uh, these numbers are tip of the iceberg. These are people who go into a GP or a testing facility and have tests done, and we know that's probably only 10% of the population who are actually uh, infected here. So pick a number, multiply by 10 or whatever number you come up with, and that's probably the real number. So, you know, the numbers are significant. Yeah, okay. So, um, well, so it's out there. So I guess it comes back to those of us who are in the business of giving vaccines. So a chance for those who are out there sticking those needles in and being the, the frontline ambassadors. Any final comments? Because uh, we're finishing in about three minutes. So um, any final comments? I'll start with Kirsten. Anything you'd like to add? And then Catherine and then Chris. Nothing extra from me. Thanks, Rod. And Catherine? I just think take every opportunity to discuss vaccines. You know, even if you've got a parent in and you're discussing something and they're with a child, discuss the vaccines for the child. So as a healthcare professionals, it's a team effort. Um, we got to use all ways, means possible to get those vaccines in people's arms nice and safely. Is the air an asset or is it just another burden when you've got to report it? What's your thoughts on that? Oh, I think it's a great Australian asset. Australian Immunisation Register, yeah. sorry. I should... No, <laughs> it's great. It's, it's good for someone like me who can just look at it and see where what's missing, what they've had. So I think it's it's fantastic and obviously mandated that we have to put all our vaccines on there now. So, no, I think it's a great asset. So just a question came up about why, what about other diseases uh, like pneumococcal and um uh, I guess going back in the past when we had nasal flu injections. So uh, the vaccines are around. There's different vaccines for um, different occasions. The H3N2, I think, was the barrier against the nasal one, but uh, we've got new vaccines like the cellular ones, the high-dose ones, um, the adjuvant ones, which are looking at all of, of those things. So I think Australia's on top of it, um, but uh, uh, it's, the, uh, it's the awareness, the awareness, the awareness. And I think all of us are conscious of the fact that it's people at risk and then we've got to have clearly in our mind who's at risk so that we can talk about it and also as uh, Ian's talking about um, people feel like they're bulletproof and they don't see themselves um, as at risk but uh, I was interested in Singapore view with COVID they said to people um, how old are you oh I'm 65 it's like well the average life expectancy is 80 so you've got 15 more years how do you want to live that 15 years uh, well or you want to be sick with some sort of uh, so that's another strategy. Um, so, um, but yeah, we've got air, we've got to use it. So Chris, any final comments you want to? I think we've we've covered off that, that major things. This year is different. There is a new vaccine um, on uh, the, the Influenza National Immunisation Program, which gives more choice. And so uh, I think, Catherine, you hit the nail on the head, make sure it's uh, front of our mind. Um, you know, I do uh, have a massive call out to all the immunizers who are watching uh, and also on the panel. You know, you make a massive difference and it's on us to uh, continue to um, mention it at every opportunity. Okay, thank you. So this is the first of three. Um, the panel discussion, I think, thank you for everyone for participating. Thanks, Ian, Catherine, Chris and Kirsten for your input. Um, it's been really fantastic. I'd like to also thank the audience for their uh, participation. But remember, it just gets better as we get deeper into the season and we see whether our predictions now and what's happening is, is going to be better or worse. 
And so I, um, we hope to see everyone uh, in the next month, I think the 22nd of May for the next uh, one, um, the second of our third. And please register through our website. So the www.immunisationcoalition.org.au. So thank you. We value your feedback. Please um, get back. Please let us know what you thought of it. Um, if there's anything we uh, haven't talked about, uh, there's a post-webinar uh, survey um, which should be sent to you after this meeting. So, um, yeah, thank you, everyone, and good night.